Hello everyone, my name is Mahendra Mahay and I'm the manager of British Library Labs, a project which encourages people to experiment with the British Library's digital collections and data. I'm going to be giving you an introduction into the British Library, a little bit about our data that we collect and some of the projects that we've been working on. In another presentation, I'll be talking about a specific data collection or digital collection that you'll be working on as part of your project at Malmo University. British Library Labs was formed in March 2013 and since then we've supported over 175 projects working with researchers, artists, entrepreneurs, educators and British Library staff to get them to experiment and do things with our digital collections and data. We're hoping you'll be doing exactly the same thing as part of your course. We've done this through competitions, awards and projects, and you will be working on a project working with one of our data sets and specifically to look at visualizing some of that data. We've also been sharing our work across the world with other similar types of labs in galleries, libraries, archives and museums. I've created a folder which is shown there on the screen which you can use to download useful materials for this course relating to the British Library. You'll also notice at the bottom there are uh, links to Twitter handles, my email address and also the link to the folder where you can download useful files for the course. So a little bit of background about myself. Um, I've been at the British Library for eight years, but I've been working in lots of fields. I have a background in using digital technology and I've worked as a manager, educator, researcher, advisor, and community builder in further and higher education for researchers, educators, librarians, students, businesses, both in the UK and internationally. Today's session will be encouraging you to look at two videos that I'm going to post, which is they're both together collectively about one hour, 30 minutes. And then in the afternoon, I'll be available to answer questions and also talk a little bit about your assignment and for you to start to think about some ideas of what you might want to do with the data set that I'm going to tell you about later on. The work that you'll be doing on the course that's related to this presentation will be assignment two, the group based work around data analytics and visualization, which is worth five credits and it will be assessed through oral and visual means. Today you'll get an overview of the library, the data set, and to start to think of some ideas of what you would like to do with the data. On Thursday the 10th and Friday the 11th of September, we'll, you'll be looking at selecting a portion of the data, possibly cleaning it and thinking about what you might want to do with it in terms of visualization, i.e. coming up with some of your first ideas. And throughout the course, you'll be able to keep in touch with us through Slack if you have any questions or problems. I'm going to ask Pillar to go into much more detail about this assignment, but essentially the assignment is you will be working as a group on visualizing part of the British Library's data set that I'm going to be talking about. Things that you might want to think about as you're coming up with ideas is why you chose the idea that you did, what kinds of questions could the data set that you're going to come up with or the visualization be answering? It might be useful to also record the methods and tools you're going to use to work with the data. I understand you may be using Tableau, but I'll be talking about another tool to clean up the data called OpenRefine. How did you check the quality of the data that you've actually collected, the accuracy, the comprehensiveness, and the consistency? And it might be worthwhile actually coming up with a description of the data set because we may want to take that data set that you create and put it on our systems. It's also useful to think 
and note down some of the challenges you will face and how you may resolve them as you're working along. And I understand at the end of the course, you'll be giving a 10 to 15 minute, 15 minute presentation um, about uh, the visualization that you've created. But as I said earlier, please speak to Pillar for further details on the assignment. As I mentioned earlier, we will be taking uh, some of your data sets and storing them on our institutional repository. This is a great way for you to leave a legacy as part of the British Library's work. Who knows, your data sets or the work that you create may be available for other people to use for their own projects. The British Library, or BL, was founded in 1973, though its origins stem back to the British Museum Library in 1753. Here you can see the building in London, St Pancras. Part of the building actually resembles a ship. At St Pancras in London, 20% uh, of our items are stored. Um, and some of, uh, some of the storage areas actually beneath the building, about four storeys. The library is a legal deposit library, which, is, which means that you can only look at the items within the building. It's a reference library, you can't take anything out. Inside the library there is space for about 1,200 readers, and we get about half a million visitors per year. 80% of our collections are actually stored about 200 kilometers away in a sort of factory ba based location in Boston Spa near Leeds. These are huge warehouses, some of them use low oxygen and robots, where we store the majority of our materials. We also pay uh, living authors um, royalties if their items are taken out in public libraries. The British Library's purpose is to support custodianship and research, but also to support business, culture, learning, and it has an international focus. Our aim is to make our intellectual heritage accessible to everyone for research, inspiration, and enjoyment, and be the most open, creative, and innovative institution of its kind by 2023, which will be our 50th year anniversary. Our collections are vast. We're probably the first or the second largest library on the planet. Um, this is just an estimation, but we have over 200 million items. 16 million of them are books, around about 9%. And as you can see, we have many other things like patents, stamps, maps, sound recordings, and musical scores, manuscripts, and serial titles. So the library doesn't just contain books. When you are looking for physical items in the, in the British Library, it sometimes feels a little bit like this. Imagine a huge hypermarket, which has lots of different things on the shelves. Imagine this hypermarket also has a huge warehouse at the back where there wasn't space to put things on the shelves. This is what it feels like when you're working with the British Library's physical collections. Let's now talk about the library's digital collections. 4% of the library's physical collections are actually digitized, which doesn't sound like much. Most of this digitization takes place through partnerships with commercial and other organizations like philanthropic and charitable organizations. The amount that we are storing digitally is increasing rapidly, but it's really important to say that there is a bias in our digitization. What we digitize doesn't always represent what we have physically. And because the percentage is so small, 
there's obviously a bias in what we have. Also, only 15% of our digital collections are openly licensed, and these are online. 85% of our digital collections are only available on site. We also capture born digital collections like websites, ebooks, and we are a significant partner in the Alan Turing Institute, which is Center for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning. The really important thing to understand why this percentage is so small is digitizing our collections costs money, time and resources. So how does it feel like when you're looking for collections in digital form at the library? It feels a little bit like this. Imagine going into an old sweet shop, which has lots of free things on the shelves. It's a lot smaller than the hypermarket where we have our physical collections, but we actually have access to a large warehouse at the back. And if you go into that warehouse, that warehouse is actually enormous. So how do you find open British Library cultural heritage data sets? You can refer to our collection guides, which are written by our curators. Sometimes they include a section on what's available digitally. As of today, we have 252 of them and there's a link for you to explore further. If you'd like to download some of our digital collections and data, we have a portal called data.bl.uk. A number of years ago, we made a decision to treat all our collections as data. Each data set has a unique identifier called a digital object identifier. And this means you can download collections in their thousands instead of individual items. We also now have an open access repository which is where the data is going to be sitting permanently and you'll be able to download collections from here um, in their thousands. It's really important to know the background to all our collections and that's, this also applies to our digital collections. Knowing the story will tell you more about why that collection exists, why things were selected, why there are specific biases in terms of what's in there, and this will help you when you're working with it. These, there are a number of questions here that I've asked over the years. Probably the very last one that appears is, is there a curator at the British Library, a human being who can tell you more about the collection? This is often the best way to learn about the story behind a collection. Why does the British Library need computational help? As, as I noted earlier, we have a lot of items and approximately 3 million items are added every year. Cataloguing or describing these items is often minimal and incomplete which means therefore it's very difficult to find items sometimes, let alone things within the items. What is a digital glam lab? Well, it's a space to experiment or innovate online or on site with the digitized and or born digital collections and data. Glam, by the way, stands for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. This is the space that I work in, and this is the space you're going to be working in as part of your project. So let's take a peek inside a Glam Lab. In a Glam Lab, there could be digital maps, photographs, and manuscripts, 3D virtual objects of Egyptian heads and vases, digitized books from the 17th century with pictures of strange animals next to the originals, sound recordings of machines and violin music, old TV programs that have been digitized, millions of pages of text from newspapers, video games from the 1980s, websites that no longer exist, and computer programs which worked on machines that no one makes anymore. There are people coming in and out to chat, to tinker, to transform, and to share. 
We have a number of digital collections and data sets at the British Library. We had broadcast TV and radio news. We have playbills, books and newspapers. We have music, digitised music, such as recordings and sheet music. And we also have sounds that have been recorded, such as animal sounds and machine sounds. We have images, manuscripts and maps. The Qatar Digital Library has a large collection of digitised images and manuscripts and maps from the Middle East. The International Dunhuang Project has digitised materials from China, Mongolia and Tibet. Hebrew manuscripts contain a very large collection of digitised Hebrew manuscripts. We have a large number of digitised maps, which are also geo-referenced. The British National Bibliography contains descriptions of our holdings. Uh, we also collect usage data and we are the home of the UK Web Archive, where we have been collecting websites from all UK web domains. The really important thing to note is that cultural heritage data is dirty. Here is a, a small snapshot of the descriptions that are used to describe data, which, which has been created by humans. For example, you can see that humans vary um, the description of the United States of America. Sometimes it appears as USA or U.S. or United States of America. Um, and also there's lots of inconsistency in the way humans describe things. This means that it's very difficult to work with, especially if you want to do data analytics or visualization, something that you're going to find when you're going to be working with our data. A tool that you may have time to learn is called OpenRefine, which is a very powerful tool which you'll be able to use to clean the data. I've created a folder in the folder, uh, the link to the folder down at the bottom, uh, and there's a folder called OpenRefine, which contains worksheets and data that you can use to learn how, how to use OpenRefine. The work that we do in our lab is to try to connect our audience interests with the digital collections that we have. We work in this area, which is the sweet spot in the middle. This work often is, is difficult and requires lots of iterations. And remember that only a small proportion of our physical collections are actually digitized. So who do we work with at the British Library? Well, we work primarily with researchers to get them to experiment with our digital collections. We're also based within the Digital Scholarship Department of the British Library. Over the years, we've also worked with artists, librarians and curators, software developers, archivists, entrepreneurs and educators. These are some of the recommended phases of interaction and engagement when you work with labs. This may help you when you're working on the project. The first thing that we think that you're going to be doing is going on a data journey. This is really important that you get to know the data, download it and start to look at it. Once you start to look at the data, this will help influence you in terms of what you would like to do with it. It's very, very important to do this because once you see the data, it will give you an idea of the scope of things you might want to do. This is often iterative, so you need to keep going back to it. But hopefully by the end of your data journey, you will have a well-informed question once you have dug into the collection. This is when you will start to be much more focused and we call this the query focused part of your investigation. Again, this is iterative, but this is where you may want to get some support from us. And finally, it's really important to have a hard deadline, which means set a, uh, sets a realistic goal um, with the tools and methods you want to use with your data and then just see where you are and I would recommend doing that fairly early just to get an idea of where you're going by the end of that you'll have an idea of where to take the next steps the collection that we're going to be looking at 
um, at the British Library for your project is a collection of digitized 19th century books. This is a collection of 65,000 books that were digitized in 2007 and 2008. So it's important to note that the technology that we use to digitize them uh, came from that time period. The funding for this project came from Microsoft. Subjects include philosophy, poetry, history, literature, and they cover that date range, 1789 to 1876. We strongly recommend that you look at this collection guide for these books. This will give you a, a much better idea of what's actually in there and tell you a little bit more about the story behind it and, and also some of the things that we've done with it. I'm going to talk about some projects just to sort of inspire you, uh, which have used some of the, uh, some of the things within this collection. David Normal, an artist from California, created a series of collage paintings. David took the, um, the images from some of these books, cut them out, collaged them and repainted them on an epic scale and created four surrealistic type paintings. These were then exhibited as light boxes at the Burning Man Festival in 2014. What was really interesting for us was that the images that he used came from these books. We then worked with David to take these light boxes and exhibit them at the British Library in 2015 through the Labs project. That's David standing there with the light boxes installed outside in our piazza. We also created an app which hover, when you hovered over the paintings it would take you back to the page in the image where that came from in the book. Mario Klingerman, a code artist, was our very first artistic award winner and Mario did some very exciting work with the images from these books. He started using algorithmic methods to identify what was in the images. So for example on, on the left you can see 44 men who look 44. He used face recognition algorithms to classify the faces. On the right are a collection of images he calls a hat on the ground spells trouble. These are images that Mario found in the images of these books. Mario then did some further algorithmic work on creating computational portraits using a set of Western portraiture images that have been digitized and he won a major arts prize as a result of this. In 2019 I worked with an artist called Michael Takura Magruder and we worked on creating artworks based on four digitized maps that were found in these books. One of New York, London, Paris and Chicago. Michael created two physical works and two digital works based on these maps. And we had a very successful exhibition with over 150,000 visitors. There were lots of talks and events, and we even created a limited, limited edition book. We've also worked with DJs and algo ravers to take our data and perform it through programming or something called an algo rave. And in 2019, at the launch of the Imaginary Cities exhibition, the previous slide that I talked about, we had an algo rave where we, where we had artists to take our data and perform, perform it. Okay, 